Welcome everyone to another episode of Macro Matters, where we talk about the macro that matters for our CFA members and their guests. Um, as always, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, uh, Monique Vanos and Tony Zhang. Welcome to both of you. Hi, Rich. Hi, Monique. Hi, Glad to both of you. So last uh, last time we talked about crypto, and we were talking about the uh, the Bitcoin ETF, and I, I shared that uh, video that we did. Um, on my Substack, and it was pretty popular. So I think you know, kudos to both of you because you're the experts in in the the area. But I I wanted to, you know, this time we're as we go along, we're going to ask each other some questions about what we're seeing in the markets, et cetera. And I just wanted to follow up on the last, um, you know, the last macro matters that we did, where we talked about crypto, and we got the news of the Bitcoin ETF. But it's been, you know, prices have been lower. I think we're at 30 day lows in the range for most, most coins at this point. So what happened? Tony, you want to, you want to take the first stab at what, you know, what, what happened there? Why wasn't yes. this a big catalyst? Co correct. Correct. Uh, Rich and Monique, apparently Monique is as, uh, even, uh, as expert in this field as well. So I will actually try to throw some of my thought idea as a clue. So last, I think, uh, we discussed in the last section that what's going to happen after the even the SEC might approve the spark Bitcoin ETF, most likely than now, or more likely than now, that we will be expecting a sell news scheme. This is exactly what happened is to actually over the past uh, couple of weeks. And what we have already seen over the um the past three months, right before the SEC approved the spot BTF, uh, spot Bitcoin ETF, we have seen oh exaggerated the over excitement about from the investors over what the potential price hype about the Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum and other alt alternative coins uh, going forward. A lot of investors especially the retail investors would expect that with the uh, injected cash flow from the institution upon the approval of spot uh, BDC ETF, then the institutional money are going to actually push the price for this kind of a uh, Bitcoin and other coins much, much higher. However, they actually just uh, underlook or overlook one potential scenario that for many of the institution, what they have underneath will be the um, risk portion. The risk for the Bitcoin ET, uh, and Ethereum, and even for the Bitcoin uh, ET, uh, ETF underneath, actually still just uh, show that the volatility is way too large to actually to incorporate a sizable amount in the overall portfolio allocation perspective. So institution, even though they want to actually maybe put, allocate some of the portion to that, had to actually weigh in and wait until the volatility really actually decreased to a certain level before they can actually take a, a meaningful action. So we probably would not um, see the huge inflow of the institutional money cash flow until maybe after three or even maybe slightly longer, six months, uh, starting from our own. Now, this is a, just overall uh, general uh, expectation. And from the other points of view, what are really happening behind uh, basically the driver for most of the coin, including the Bitcoin and Ethereum, the main driver, one apparently will be like the correlation between uh, the correlation between the Bitcoin price versus the US dollar. Now, this typically the stronger the US dollar, the weaker the weaker the the uh, the coin price. The US dollar apparently rebounds heavily from the roughly about one hundred to a hundred and three. Now, from that perspective, they gave some kind of pressures for how much or how high that actually the Bitcoin and other coins uh, price can actually appreciate it within such a short amount of window. This is apparently uh, one big thing. The second um, uh, driver mainly will be the risk appetite from the investors. 
Now, if we actually look at what happened in the equity market uh, over the for the first uh, three weeks of this year, uh, we do agree that S and P and Dow Jones, they most of the many three of the index have reached to the all time high. But if we actually look slightly deeper below the surface, what we have already seen that be beneath the surface is purely just maybe a small section of the technology semiconductor and magnificent seven stock that actually lead the market to the all time high. But the rest of the small cap stock and other sectors actually also depreciate uh, significantly. So from that perspective, that's not a really a risk on a, a scenario which actually favor the price appreciation of the, the coin price. So that's my uh, take and my thought. Now, whether that's gonna uh, change, so we definitely actually have to continue to look at how the Federal Reserve is going to talk about that, talk about the basically rain uh, policies in coming March. This is how I think. Uh, Monique, what do you think? So, um, yeah, so there was a little bit of the the news playing here in terms of uh, ETF. There was all, all the expectations all the way from the, the, the end of last year, so a few months back when people saw that uh, uh, how the SEC did not right away deny the way they denied grayscale. So people start pumping up, they knew it's coming. When BlackRock got in, people knew it's coming. So there was a lot of speculation for the past few months. That's for sure. Uh, so I see the different type of investors in this game. One type of investor is pure speculation. They right there, they just want to ride the, the, the wave and then get out and that's it. So prop traders and things like that. Now I see other type of investors uh, willing to allocate a little bit in a different asset class that's Bitcoin now um, with the ETF. And of course, these institutional clients going to come over time, right? This is like a process. Um, I think the allocators, a lot of allocators in traditional finance, they're still learning what this thing is. Uh, so they're still scratching their head. It's like, okay, how do I do? How do I invest? How do I don't invest. There was a lot of flow from grayscale, final grayscale uh, uh, to uh, to the ETFs. And now there has been like a, a, a fight for who's gonna own this ETF, right? Uh, I mean, I guess there's some already leaders there. Um, um, and uh, my, this, is a, this is a process, this is over time. This is not like a couple of weeks thing. Uh, and as soon, and, and I still believe that as soon as institutional investors come over time, um, with more inflows, um, volatility is gonna go a little bit lower and over time, people, it's, so it's gonna be a cycle, right? Volatility is gonna be lower, then less speculation, more as investment per se. I, I mean, it, this is a very long process, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, if you're here for pure speculation, you have to watch the market all the time, but if you're here for a long-term investment, then, uh, just have to be patient, getting, invest, put a little bit of your portfolio. It's riskier, but if you put that just a little bit, it's a way to manage risk and just um, um, just go for there. So. Yes, I actually uh, would like to actually add one more comment to what um, Monica just saying that uh, I uh, highly agree. I think the, from the Bitcoin and Ethereum and other alternative coins uh, perspective, there are no underlying cash flows uh, still for those coins. So the price volatility mainly just come from the supply and demands over the market. And we, as and so far at the moment that Bitcoin has, basically has no practical use beyond just being a highly volatile store of the value, right? And the, only things that's gonna happen is when we actually start to see a shortage of the supply and a, a, a skyrock of the demand that we sh would e expect uh, the price appreciator. Now, I think in uh, based on the by de design in April to, uh, 2024, so in about roughly about three months, then the supplies of the Bitcoin um, in, uh, in theory, should be half based on the mechanism. So typically, that when the supply shrink right around 
the point, um, we would tap to, uh, mainly we'll see maybe either both high volatility and and also a price hike at the moment. That this is something that um, uh, investors working on the uh, spot. Uh, Bitcoin ETF and also maybe just based on the SPA should actually really pay attention to. So this is so far we uh, now we started to see more of the practical application from the Ethereum and from Solana. Uh, uh, no doubt about that. So a lot of uh, uh, innovation over the layer one and layer two, uh, layer two over the past of the few months uh, alone. But this is we will continue to wait in. Uh, to see the, the main factors behind the price of those kind of coins, which is just the supply and demand. One, one thing I think that's interesting that you kind of touched on a little bit, Tony, is, is the interest rate moves. And, and we've talked before about how, um, about how cryptocurrency is a long duration asset. And you yes. mentioned that the, the other elements of the risky markets where we see some weakness below the surface and you see the other duration assets, like for instance, in um, the equity market, small small cap stocks, or maybe it's the technology stocks outside of the Magnificent Seven or wherever it is where it's a the longer duration stocks um, have, have, have struggled a bit the last couple of weeks because the market is st um, slowly coming to the realization that maybe the Fed's not going to cut rates as much as was has been expected. And I think that this this duration effect is weighing not just on, on crypto, but on, on other elements of risk that we see in the market. Now, of course, the Magnificent Seven, big cash flow generation machines, they're shorter duration assets. That's where people want to hide when they're worried about rate moves. And, and so some of that strength in, in the over, overall market is masking what's kind of going on for, for other elements of risk. Exactly, exactly. So now, uh, apparently the crypto uh, asset will still um, remain a very interesting or a focus of uh, asset classes among the investors, both retails and institutional investors. Um, Monique, uh, uh, what do you think, What uh, it, are there any like a major event that from an investor point of view, institutional investor point of view that they should focus on for uh, the crypto asset class this year? So, um, and again, it really depends on if you're short term or long term, right? Uh, of course, the happening you just mentioned in April, it is, it's been historically um, an event to watch. Now, this year is a little bit different because we, we coincide with the ETF about the same time. I mean, not exactly the same time, but like now, right? So we'll be interested to see it well, because usually the happening picks up for a few months before too. Uh, but this is more speculation. This is not exactly uh, for a long-term investor. Like a, I'm thinking more like an institutional investor trying to allocate some um, some money using the ETFs and things like that, right? So the, one thing that I will mention is that uh, there is a lot of talks about uh, ETH ETF. And as uh, Tony was um, talking about, uh, I mean, ETH definitely has a lot more applications on top of it. I mean, you have the entire decentralized finance on that. And the fact that uh, uh, the, 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 the actual project, it's different. Uh, the way it's set up is different than Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, we're not going to discuss this now. But uh, yeah, so this can be like uh, another one. And I think it's I think it's just a matter of like being patient that things are being built. If you talk with people in, that is working in crypto, everybody talks about building. There is a lot of coming, a lot of innovation. It's all about innovation technology, right? So that's what kind of like uh, makes a difference. So that that is, I mean, I see that the, I see crypto. Now, I don't see it as just a Bitcoin. I see it as an entire ecosystem with the different coins and different uh, applications. So it's just a matter of time. Things are being built and things are being developed and they use cases. So um, yeah, so that's that's our thing. Well, well, one thing that when I think of the enthusiasm around Bitcoin or 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 the stock market in general, which hit some all-time highs last week, right? It comes down to um, how optimistic consumers are, right? How, how, how optimistic um, investors and consumers are. Uh, Monique, I wanted to ask you a quick question. Like how... Any any evidence that you see, anecdotal or otherwise, about 
whether or not you think the consumers are doing well or not doing well? Okay, I don't have numbers in front of me, but I'm sometimes I have a feeling that uh, people are spending, is spending, and may not have the actual money to spend. And I, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any analysis in front of me about uh, how much debt uh, people are putting themselves into. Um, they'll be interested to see what's going to happen this year, uh, especially it's an election year. Uh, what the Fed is going to do with those numbers, the numbers that they have, and uh, how they see this. I mean, uh, if we're going to have a soft landing, uh, so that's that's up in the air. That's uh, I, I'm literally waiting to see it. Uh, it's an interesting year. It's definitely an interesting year, right? Because there's only so much. There's, I would say, the Fed can act normal when it's not election year, but when an election year, sometimes they may, may not. This is pure speculation. Do or not do certain things, right? So um, definitely it's going to be an interesting year this year. Well, I think along those lines, I don't know if it's the Fed we need to watch this year or if it's the central government, because one of the things I think that's been carrying the consumers along has been the fiscal stimulus that we've continued to see even when the economy is strong. And typically we don't see so much fiscal stimulus when the economy is strong. They save that for when the economy is weak. Mm -hmm. um, now, some of that, much of that is is starting to expire. Um, and, you know, that's been ex rolling expirations over the last several months. But um, the, with the, the latest potential tax deal in Washington, there's this uh, feeling that maybe there's going to be even more fiscal stimulus. And, and so, you know, that's one of the things that I, I think where I was a little bit more downbeat on the economy all of last year, I think one of the biggest things I've missed was the, the the amount and the strength of fiscal stimulus and how much that carried through consumer spending and how much that might continue to carry through consumer spending. Um, there's definitely signs of weakness, right? You look at um, you look at credit card debt. Um, it's not so much mortgage debt because people struggle to get a mortgage still, but because at these caught at these these prices, but can, the credit card debt you've seen that gone up, and now you started to see the delinquency data taking higher too, which is usually the first sign that uh, of some sort of trouble. And so much like the economic data we see where some stuff is good and some stuff is bad, you kind of see the same thing within the consumer data where some things are good and some things are bad. But I'm, I'm struck by one of the things I've been writing on LinkedIn about is at least around uh, where we are, um, the, the, the anecdotal evidence, and of course it's only a few data points, seems to be stronger than weaker. You know, where when I I see, you know, whether it be being at a, at an auto dealer or a restaurant or or higher end luxury goods or what you know what you know dur other durable goods and TVs and things like that, I just see people out spending and and maybe they're you know it's kind of a, about to end very badly for people or maybe things are just stronger than we think, but that's what I see. I don't know, Tony, what, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, yes, apparently. Rich, as you, you point out a good point. I think mainly the um, if we look at in general, the what might be the key driver for equity market are uh, actually the earning um, and profit made by the corporation. If we actually uh, use the S and P five hundred company as one proxy to really dig into that, what could potentially happen for S&P or for equity market uh, over this year. Apparently by last Friday, we saw the all time high move, all of the major three uh, index, but it was purely mainly will be just the technology sector and uh, uh, and consumer service sector that which actually carry on the whole market. Their earnings mainly were driven in, in, uh, in uh, usually it will be driven by the consumer spending. So consumers' uh, comf uh, like confidence will become uh, also a key factor that I think most of the quant investors, like quant portfolio, uh, portfolio managers are really looking into that. We don't see too much of the like a ticking high for the consumer um, uh, confidence. So we actually will actually have to fall down to from the fiscal spending, whether the uh, government this year will be able to actually either to uh, increase the fiscal spending to continue to stimulate the economies, especially in the uh, in in this year uh, presidential year, 
um, which we typically see that government, a uh, sitting government would like to actually stimulate the economy. Apparently, no one, uh, no sitting government want to see the market crash in the presidential year, right? So this is something that what we uh, a lot of investors are waiting on. So they wait on one perspective will be, even though we do not see like a, a strong high consumer sentiments, but they will actually bet on the factor that the spending from the fiscal uh, the spending from the fiscal government and simultaneously the um the demand for the AI products was skyrocket and continue to um uh, go way higher than this year. So we uh, even though maybe the AI bubble in this time the January AI bubble burst or not, it, it's still very difficult to say. However. From the valuation point of view, there are many companies that what we have already seen we have already seen this like already being higher than um the historical average. Apparently, the risk is continuously building up over there. Well, so here from an investor's point of view, that they really should folk look at what's gonna happen, what kind of company might uh actually report and can they actually continue to make sustainable earnings for investors. So this the earnings for this season will become very important for us to actually to pick into. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And, and I think it's interesting what we've seen and only about 10% of the markets reported so far, but the trend you see is very much what you hear from companies and very much what you see um, even just in, you know, if, if you talk to people, um, you know, in, in companies that you go, or, or businesses you go into is that, the sales growth numbers are positive, but the earnings growth numbers are negative. And that's an inflation, right? That, that's all it is, yeah. is that the prices are higher, but the number of units that are changing hands is lower. So people are spending the same or spending a little bit more, but they're getting less for that. And that's that's inflation. And with the com within the companies, you're seeing that um, where they're, yes, their top line is doing okay, but their margins are getting squeezed a bit. And so, um, and if we look out at the, at what's expected for earnings for the rest of this year and, and into next year, there's pretty high growth rates expected. And so um, whether or not we see inflation start to come down that gives some relief to companies and individuals on this front is, is a huge part of the story, I think, for 2024. And if you get any sort of reignition of inflation, I do think that kind of that, that, that does spell some trouble um, for both consumers and companies. And so I think that is something we need to be aware of and kind of watchful for. Yeah, agree. I actually also want to piggyback to one of the common that Monica just uh, talked about the soft landing schema. Like, um, I know that we have been talking about the soft landing uh, possibility uh, last year, at the end of last year, and also early this year. So I want to see here from both of you that whether does something have changed from your perception about the possibility of the soft landing? Because this is what the price equity market is priced, fully priced in at this moment. Yeah, I'll go first. I mean, I think as I've kind of talked with you guys before, to me, there I think there's three scenarios, right? Where we have a soft landing and Fed cuts rates. And I think that's what the market's pricing in. That's by far the most bullish scenario where the economy chugs along okay and the cost of capital comes lower. And that's that's a great place to be, right? If if you knew that was going to happen, you definitely would want to buy stocks. Now, what's probably changed in my mind is the other two scenarios. Cause I think the other two scenarios are yes, we get a soft landing, but no, the Fed doesn't cut rates, or the Fed's cutting rates because we have a hard landing. And I think before I was probably more of the opinion that I agree with the market maybe on rate cuts, but I thought we'd see more likely a hard landing. And I'm probably shifting a little bit towards the idea that maybe the economy is going to be better than I thought. Um, but I don't think the Fed, I still don't think the Fed's going to cut rates now. So I've kind of moved into that other scenario. And, and a lot of that probably comes from this idea that I think, um, you know, when post the financial crisis, we saw um, a jobless jobless recovery, right? The economic data was doing better. The stocks were doing better. But if you talk to the people on the street, people on Main Street, things were not good, right? People were not getting jobs. It took a long, long time for jobs to come back. And so there was the jobless recovery. And and, and so there are, Wall Street was doing well, but Main Street wasn't doing well. Um, 
in some ways, I think this could be the opposite of that. I think what we've seen with the labor unions negotiating very, very big pay um, increases um, to the tune of six, seven, eight percent per year. Um, the fact that we have, you know, pilots and mechanics and airline attendants <coughs> all getting paid more, and and truckers and rail getting paid more. Um, UPS drivers making one hundred and seventy-five grand now. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think their Main Street, I think, is going to be doing much better, but Wall Street is not right. Where, where do we see the layoffs? Right. Investment banks are laying people off. Software engineers are laying people off, and so. In some ways, I think this might be the opposite of what we saw then, when then the people, the the well-educated, well-compensated people were doing very well, but Main Street struggled. I think right now we might see the opposite, which I think might lead to a little bit of a soft landing. But I think the Fed's got to be careful, especially if we're getting fiscal stimulus, that I don't think we're going to see those rate cuts. But I guess that's how I shifted my thinking a little bit. Exactly. Yeah, I was I was just going to add that. Uh, um, yeah, I don't see it cuts near term. I mean, it may be it towards maybe a little bit later, but uh, um, eventually there will be. Maybe I mean, of course, it's an I'm I'm a numbers person, so and I think the Fed is kind of a numbers people too, so they they always check numbers and make decisions. But uh, I think that um, it's a, what is special about this year is the election that affects everything and decisions and uh stimulus and things like that so that's uh that's a tricky situation that we are because um we may be expect a soft land or hard land or so but because of it's a, an election year we may have some extra stimulus or things like that just to for the election so it may messes up with the whole idea that we could expect a, a cut or not cut and things like that so um that's 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 my two cents there Hey, we have time for about one more question um, today, and there, I didn't want to leave without asking one question. Maybe I'll, Tony, I'll start with you. Is this topic comes up with with a lot of a lot of my students? I know you guys have a lot of the same students as me. Um, yeah, and, and hit, it's close to home. But if we look at the Chinese stock market, it is almost back to COVID lows. Right, we're at all time highs in the U.S. stock market, and China's Chinese market is going the other way. And we know last year there was a big expectation that the economy was going to reopen and and that kind of fizzled and went nowhere. We've, we've seen some stimulus. It doesn't seem to have worked. Do you have any thoughts or insights on, on what might be going on in, in China and why the, the stock market there is, is so low? Yeah, Rich, uh, this is a tough question to actually do. To, to answer because there are actually many uh, fundamental reasons behind this uh, this thing behind a scenario. Actually, last week that if we actually uh, look at what had happened over the both Hong Kong stock market and Chinese stock market, they uh, combo significantly and even by um, close last night that it pretty much reached to almost past 24 months out. And as what you pointed out, getting close to 2008 and 2007 is like uh, the low as well. Now we, there are many reasons, both economic reasons and uh, political reason. Last week, I think uh, former President Trump also joked on that. They say, the ones they hear that I actually came out from the Iowa's uh, uh, caucus that the stock market in, in China was, was tumble, right? <laughs> Apparently, you know, that is one of the uh, sentimental uh, factors over there. We have no, um, we have no like uh, any like facts or number to prove that's right or wrong. But as what you can people we can imagine is that apparently the tension between the U.S. and China, two largest uh, economies on the uh, on the world apparently is one of the major driver be um, behind the actually the poor performance of the Chinese stock market. We have continued to see the U.S. Um, financial company, including the BlackRock, Citibank. Um, JP Morgan continue to actually to uh, pull out the capital from the mainland China and Hong Kong stock market exchange. And there was a report uh, last, uh, I think last week that continue to see that both active 
and uh, active managed ETF and also passive uh, managed ETF uh, from the Western, uh, from mainly the North American investor continue to actually see the negative cash flow, which means they actually sell the ETF, which give the pressures to the Chinese stock market um, in both uh, China's Asia and Hong Kong stock market share. Now at the moment, what we uh, have already continued to see um, that we doubt the support of the cash flow and the, ca the capital institution pretty much might not be able to do too, uh, too much just because of the shortage of the liquidity. The liquidity is just like a, the uh, the blood to human being is actually the blood to the um, the market over there. Now with the liquidity continue coming out with the uh, US actually the uh, continue to hold the high interest rate uh, here is overseas, then the capital is very smart. They will continue to shift from the low interest rate uh, system to a high interest rate uh, system. We doubt even considering about the relative appreciation of the Euro, uh, US dollar uh, to the Chinese uh, currency, like Chinese RMB. So we sort of both of this kind of a, uh, impact both of the, the capital, the carry trades, is not in favor of the Chinese stock market and Hong Kong stock exchange. Now, with the political tensions uh, add up to this kind of uh, shortage of liquidity, then whether the confidence from the uh, investor, from the retail investor and institutional investors can actually come back and provide the, the capital to support, um, that's actually a big, question marks as well, as I continue to actually talk to both institutional investors um, uh, in China and in Hong Kong, like almost pretty much on a daily basis, I actually saw very little of the confidence from their point of view, even though the central government of China continue to um, show some uh, positive tone and gesture to say they will act, they will, are fully committed to support the economy and they are trying to rebuild and restrain the investors' confidence in uh, the Chinese economy. So whether that can go uh, to become successful, this is something that we don't know yet. And at least from the market reactions, um, even the overnight, this is still not the case. No, I, I I think I think it's really interesting, and I, I don't envy um, global fund managers that have an MSCI Emerging Market Benchmark because twenty five percent of their benchmark is China, and yes. I think you're right. A lot of global investors are feeling that China is uninvestable for one reason or another, and Correct. so we see money flowing out of China, but we know where it's going. We've talked about it for a year. It's going into India. India yes. stock market is at all time highs, much like the U.S., and so we. Even within the emerging markets, we see a clear sign of haves and have nots. Um, you know, is there a catalyst for for that to change? I don't know. I don't. I don't know if the U.S. election is a catalyst for that because, <laughs> based on what I've seen and, and read, I don't think the foreign policies have changed too much. Even though the president has changed, so I don't think that's going to change too much. But I, th I think that that we certainly have seen, you know, multinational companies rationalizing their supply chains and, and moving things closer to where they make it either in Eastern Europe or in, or in, you know, in North America, mostly Mexico. And so there's maybe less of a U.S. corporate um, reason to be in China other than to make things to sell in Asia or sell into China. So we, we've definitely seen maybe a pivot in that 20 year trend of, of globalization that we had seen benefiting China. It seems like we're, that that's changing a little bit. I don't, I don't know how long that could be. Um, we're, we're kind of just at about time, but I wanted to leave it, Monique, any, any last questions or comments that you had for us? Um, not really. I, it's more, if you, it's more like a vote, let's put it this way, soft landing or hard landing <laughs> for you too. What do you guys think? Tony, yeah, so, you, you think, Tony, we have a soft yeah, landing? Yeah, so, uh, here, here, let me just, uh, continue to um re-emphasize our viewpoints since the, i think beginning of last year we continue to argue that investors continue to overlook the possibility that federal reserve will hold the interest rate uh, higher and longer scenario 
stock market always probably didn't, the Federal Reserve will continue to cut the interest rate sooner and faster in November, in December, in March. We continue to argue this is not a case. However, the invest, uh, stock market investor has not been heard, uh, not simply because they hold the view right, just simply because right now the introduction of the technology, the advance of AI technology suddenly actually boosts the future expectation about the earning um, for the major corporation of tech joints, right? Including both Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, Tesla, NVIDIA. So uh, we, again, want to actually do um, cause the attention from the investors. Last year, Magnificent Sevens uh, by themselves are the major driver behind the S&P 500's performance and which actually leading to the new high by uh, close Friday last week. Now, if we actually look at um, forward, fast forward to this month, uh, to the end of this year, whether the as um, the Magnificent Seven will continue this kind of a performance, which is seen from, even from a statistical point of view, it's very rare, it's very uh, difficult to continue to achieve like on average 62% ret uh, annualized return. This is almost this is, uh, impossible. So um, from this year, we can continue, we should actually continue to focus on the quality of uh, and also the earning volatility of the company's uh, profit. I think they will become the main factor that investors should pay attention to, not just purely just uh, have a high thing that either we have soft landing scenario or the Federal Reserve is going to cut the interest rate sooner or faster. The luck may not be uh, on the side uh, this year. Yeah, that those that those are great points, Tony. I guess I would only um add, the only thing I would add to that is I mentioned before that I'm kind of maybe leaning more towards the soft landing, but the point is for from a, from an investor standpoint, it doesn't matter if even if it's soft landing because it's what's priced into the stocks, right? And if we look at what's priced in from an earnings standpoint, the expectations are very high, and so I don't know if those expectations on earnings are going to be met. And if we look at the PE that's being priced in, we're almost back to the 2021 highs. And so if we think, and I think that the Fed's going to be not be as aggressive in cutting rates as the market thinks, that seems to me like that's probably too much good news priced in. So I, I look at what we see and and I see a lot of I see a lot of good news priced into the broader market. And that makes me nervous. And I understand, like as Tony said, that right now the Magnificent Seven continues to carry. But I think what we saw most of last year is that while seven stocks were doing well, the bulk of the market and the most people's portfolios were not doing well until the last maybe eight weeks of the year. And I feel like that's going to be what we're going to see here, at least for the next three or three or four months. Um, you know, and, and that if the market does well, it's only because a handful of names do well. And that broadening out that everyone saw at the end of last year wasn't really a sign of more things to come. That was just maybe a, a seasonal technical um, influence. And we're kind of back to where we were the rest of the uh, for the rest of the year. Yeah, exactly, uh, Rich. I highly agree with what you're just saying. Actually, to maintain the such kind of a high value, relatively high valuation level for major tech joints, Magnificent Seven here we talk about that the Mag Magnificent Seven companies have to actually deliver. The both revenue and earning per share uh, on a, a relatively high uh, twenty percent plus, like a, a gross uh, rate for both the revenue and also the earning per share. I mean, to really to do that, think of from uh, our perspective, they are actually the huge joints within the economy. They actually represent forty five percent of S and P five hundred. So pretty much, they their growth should just. Uh, be lined up to just align with the main uh, economic growth from a high broad perspective. Now with uh, GDP growth in the US grow roughly about 5% and for them to actually to have, to try to achieve like a 20 plus percent uh, annual growth rate, the only way that what they can possibly do might be just continue to lay off people and to cut a cost. So this is something that we, I think, those um, company, um, we we might continue to see more of the layoff on the major company if 
holding the, the investors or the stock price is the senior executives kind of a concern might be the case. Well, well, why don't we leave it there? Um, Monique and Tony, thanks again for, for joining me on this episode of Macro Matters. Um, for all the listeners, we will be back again in a couple of weeks to cover whatever is the most interesting topic. Maybe we'll get more into earnings um, in a couple of weeks when we'll have more of the market having uh, reported at that point, and we'll we'll dig into what we're seeing there. But Mon Monique and Tony, thanks for joining me, and have a good hey. week. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Monique. Uh, have a great week.